Welcome to another CME podcast episode from NEI, the Neuroscience Education Institute. In today's CME episode, Dr. Andrew Cutler will be interviewing Dr. William Sauvé about how to manage psychiatric treatment of patients who use methamphetamines or have a history of use and abuse. For complete CME information, please refer to the NEI podcast description page at nei.global forward slash podcast. Let's listen in as Drs. Cutler and Sauvé discuss treating psychiatric illness in the context of patients who are using methamphetamines. Well, it's, it's really great that you could join me here today. Well, Dr. Cutler, I'm very excited to be in your presence. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> well, we're going to have an interesting discussion today about methamphetamine and all these different aspects of its abuse. You know, it, it was at one time a drug that could be prescribed, and technically it still can be, but I think it's rarely prescribed these days, and mostly we deal with it on the abuse end. Will, can you start by telling us how does methamphetamine work exactly? Well, the most important thing, I think every follower of the Neuroscience Education Institute has heard me say a million times, I always start with not well understood, right? So we can say all kinds of stuff and it's still not 100% clear. That yeah. said, by a variety of mechanisms, methamphetamine is powerfully dopaminergic. I would say that first and foremost, but it is also noradrenergic and serotonergic. And very importantly, not only does methamphetamine by a variety of mechanisms inhibit the reuptake of dopamine and other neurotransmitters, but it also induces the release of dopamine. So it's a double dopaminergic hit when you're yeah. using methamphetamine, which you know kind of speaks to how powerful it is and famously so. And that sounds like that's part of the reason it's so addictive, because it produces such a powerful euphoria from that dopamine. Well, exactly. Just thinking in terms of how reinforcement works, then yes, it will be highly reinforcing because you'll get exactly what you came for. <laughs> okay. Well, speaking of that, what are some of the neuropsychiatric consequences from long-term methamphetamine use? Three big ones. Number one, interestingly, is cognitive impairment. And most interesting to me, I would say, because my wheelhouse is depression by virtue of what I do every day. And evidence for methamphetamine inducing depression or anxiety in the long term is thin, very, very thin. So I would never like hang my hat on that. But cognitive impairment is pretty good. So by virtue of possibly the neurotoxicity over time of methamphetamine, you can see impairments in a multitude of cognitive areas. And then I would go so far as to say that's a big part of what depression is. So I suspect that there's no accident that you can see long-term cognitive impairment and then maybe depression, anhedonia, and a yeah. couple other things down the line. The other big one is persistent psychosis. And that's a little sticky because you can see acute psychotic symptoms. I would say, and, and you can feel free to correct me, with any big dose, maybe overdose of a psychostimulant. So anything that is highly dopaminergic too much of it on board could result in an acute psychotic syndrome, but the big long-term consequence of methamphetamine use could be persistent psychotic symptoms that don't go away within 24 hours of stopping the use of a water-soluble drug, yeah. and you should see that go away unless some sort of long-lasting damage has been achieved. And then the third big one on the list is Parkinson's disease. Somewhat rare, but a greater than zero consequence of long-term methamphetamine use. Well, I would think if you're burning out dopamine neurons, that really is the underlying mechanism of idiopathic Parkinson's disease. Precisely. And again, going back to not well understood, so I don't know that the one-to-one -one relationship is 100% proven there, but with chronic methamphetamine use possibly resulting in the long-term with Parkinson's disease, what is seen is an acute reduction in striatal dopamine levels and dopamine synthesis. Mm -hmm. It's basically the proposed mechanism of Parkinson's being a hypodopaminergic syndrome and the mm -hmm. death of the cells in the substantia nigra. Then we see that with this reduction in striatal dopamine and dopamine synthesis. Also, lasting dopamine transporter alterations with repeated exposure. Mm -hmm. So ringing that bell again and again and again mm -hmm. can ultimately change the transporter in a way that it doesn't necessarily go back. 
And then thirdly, a structural degeneration of dopaminergic neurons. Again, speaking right to that substantia mm -hmm. nigra with a very high dose of exposure. What's really interesting there, it's sort of a rare syndrome with Parkinson's disease. So you could argue that in methamphetamine users, it's less rare as opposed mm -hmm. to necessarily common, but also that I, I think it's a little more supportive that it presents earlier. Mm -hmm. So that might almost suggest a patient who was already vulnerable to Parkinson's disease and maybe long-term methamphetamine use speeded it along. Well, that's fascinating. We know that there's got to be genetic vulnerabilities here. And certainly there's a lot of genetic variability in the dopamine system and how it's regulated. We certainly know that. Exactly. So you're talking about something that may be lasting, not just an acute or temporary Parkinson's picture, but something that you've done irreparable harm or damage to the dopamine system. Precisely. And to hammer that nail the rest of the way into the board, there are some consequences of methamphetamine use, with cognitive impairment being one of them, that abstinence from methamphetamine has resulted in improvement or maybe even resolution of those issues. Not every time. So there's far from a guarantee that getting off methamphetamine will make it go away, but it is possible. I have not seen in my reading that Parkinson's disease necessarily resolves with the discontinuation of methamphetamines. So exactly to your point, there may be damage that is not particularly reversible. And once it started, and particularly in a case like methamphetamine, you started early, then you know, you're on that train and it's only going one way. Yeah. And my understanding is there's also significant withdrawal problems, including prominently fatigue, maybe some cognitive impairment and depression, not necessarily in the acute state, but in the withdrawal state. And these things can last quite a while as well. Indeed. And again, with no guarantee that some of them will ever go away. So that's a highly frustrating aspect of treatment of this disorder. Well, it sounds like that's negatively reinforcing and would turn you back to using the methamphetamine to deal with that. Oh, precisely. Okay. I want to ask you, switch gears a little bit, just for our audience to understand here, maybe recognize and maybe be able to use terms that patients will resonate with. Can you give me examples of some of the street names that people use for methamphetamine? Yes, and I'll say them as fast as I can, right? So, because there are legion of just a few. We have crystal meth. I think that's probably most commonly known, sometimes shortened to crystal. Also, Chrissy, Tina, because all drugs deserve cute names. Crank, mm -hmm. speed, shards, glass, ice, go, whiz, which is interesting because that sounds gross. Also on the list is dope, which that bothers me more than anything because it makes me feel old because I'm old enough to remember when dope meant marijuana. Mm -hmm. And I used the word dope in front of a young person and got the biggest eye roll you've ever seen because <laughs> apparently dope means something completely different now. And I no longer speak the language. Well, for our generation, dope used to also mean cool. Something was dope. So. Right, right. No, and then I think it came back for a little while. And then now apparently it means methamphetamine. Yes. <laughs> now, some of these names make me wonder when you talk about crystal ice shards, it makes me wonder what does it actually look like? It can probably be somewhat variable in the way that it looks. But the most common, it's a crystally, maybe a powder. And the way that's derived, when methamphetamine is cooked, at some point in the process, it actually comes out as a relatively solid piece or shards of a crystalline substance that then is broken up. And so you might see it in a baggie as being a whitish, somewhat opaque, kind of white colored, crystally, almost to a powdery substance. Um, interestingly, this documentary I watched one time called Breaking Bad, you may have heard of it. Yes. It, um, it suggested that if methamphetamine was particularly pure, it came out blue. And to this day, I don't have a way of knowing how true that is. <laughs> that that <laughs> might have been a, a purely Hollywood thing, or it might have actually been based in some real world experience. Yeah. Well, in talking about the kinds of effects that methamphetamine can have, and especially the damaging effects, it strikes me that methamphetamine must be more potent than other stimulants, particularly regular amphetamine and methylphenidate. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that. And the methamphetamine in and of itself, it's a racemic substance of meth dextroamphetamine and levo dextroamphetamine. And when they're split up, they have their own properties. And if I'm remembering correctly, the meth dextroamphetamine 
is perhaps just a bit more powerful, but relatively short lived. And the levomethamphetamine has a little bit more of a long lasting to it. So there's a bit of a suggestion that the two of them together might be kind of a one, two punch yeah. of giving you that high, high potency and a certain amount of perpetuation of the effects. Well, dextromethamphetamine is a lot more potent than Levo, but you're right, Levo lasts a little longer. I don't want to scare our audience because we often prescribe amphetamine and methylphenidate for ADHD, and methamphetamine is something that's way more potent and we wouldn't necessarily want to prescribe. Yeah, I would completely agree with that. As Well, first of all, you alluded very early on that technically it can be prescribed, and that just you know brings me back to grade school when some adult said just because you can doesn't mean you should. <laughs> so I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend you know going down that road. I think it's become a little popular on the street to sometimes suggest that ADHD medications are no different than giving people meth. And and when I hear that, that makes me grind my teeth, exactly. which is by the way a well known side effect of using stimulants. But you're right. That's absolutely not true. I mean, methamphetamine is a different animal. Yeah. And another consequence you're reminding me of is the so-called meth mouth that people. Yes, 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 yes. That and interestingly, I don't know, what, what's your experience with the, not your experience with meth mouth because your, your teeth look wonderful to me. But have you heard anything in particular about the proposed mechanism for that? Because I've heard a few things and they're all very, very interesting. But I wondered what you thought first. Yeah, well, first of all, again, the stimulants we more commonly prescribe, like amphetamine and methylphenidate, don't seem to cause this. So, it, it, And they all cause dry mouth. So some people say it's dry mouth. Right. So I don't think it, it can't just be dry mouth. But I think because of the potency, I, I do think you get more bruxism and grinding of the teeth. And then also what happens is these are people who are just so enamored of the drug and using it all the time that they may not take care of their teeth as well. And then there's also a propensity towards high sugar, high caloric foods and drinks like sodas and things. So it, it, right. it's a multifactorial kind of thing. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Have you, have you ever heard somebody call it Mountain Dew mouth? Uh, I've not, but that makes sense to me. And it was code for meth mouth. It kind of became a bit of a joke in a substance abuse program where I used to work where someone would say, well, I got Mountain Dew mouth and everyone would laugh and say he just doesn't want to admit that he uses methamphetamine. Well, I don't know if you saw the recent documentary Tiger King, but there was a fantastic example of meth mouth. Uh, indeed, indeed. One other really interesting thing, though, because what you said about the possible causes of it are all consistent with what I've read with neglect and even stereotypies associated with using methamphetamine so that people even get caught in a loop of doing the same thing over and over again and personal neglect. But the final interesting bit, and it reminds me of what's so bad about uh, crocodile, is that methamphetamine is quite often being made by, shall we say, amateur pharmacologists oh, yes. who may or may not be the most studious with their methods, not to come down on anybody too hard, so that the making of methamphetamine can result in your methamphetamine being adulterated with gasoline would be a good example. Red phosphorus. I think I've heard bleach, you know, a variety of things that aren't really the methamphetamine. And when you smoke that powder, yeah. you may actually be smoking gasoline, smoking red phosphorus. And that may also be contributing to maybe some of the particularly ugly oral consequences of oh this goodness. drug. You know, I want to go back to ADHD for a second. I have a couple questions about ADHD. So what can you say about using methylphenidate in particular to treat ADHD in a person with a history of methamphetamine use? So rather than using an amphetamine, a methylphenidate. Boy, doesn't the very thought kind of put the fear into you? It does. And I'm sure that's the reason for the question, that using stimulants in someone with a fairly clear-cut history of stimulant abuse is mm -hmm. going to be nerve-wracking for the most... Uh, what rock rooted of any of us. But I would go back to basics and I would start by saying the obvious that the diagnosis is extremely important, which I think that's kind of a problem in modern psychiatry in general. You know, when an adult is in front of you with symptoms of ADHD, it could be a lot of things, correct? And ADHD stemming from childhood is kind of one of the last ones on the list and very, very difficult to prove. If an adult is in front of me and they have a history of methamphetamine use, Symptoms that look like ADHD may very well be cognitive impairment that was a consequence of methamphetamine use. So I would start by saying that if I could get that patient abstinent 
there is a possibility that that might resolve. And then I could reassess the patient and maybe get an idea of if ADHD exists at all, or if this was really induced by chronic stimulant use in the first place, and then treat from there. But I guess at the end of that, let's pretend I have a hypothetical patient who has a clear-cut diagnosis of ADHD. So I have reports from their parents when they were a kid and reports from school when they were a kid and all the information I need. In other words, a unicorn has just walked into my office because I have everything I need to know. And methamphetamine was layered on top of that. Of course, that makes me think that they were using methamphetamine because they actually felt better. Fair point. I think so. And I, I would say I don't know that it's a unicorn. I think that there, there is the, such a thing as adult ADHD. And some of these people may be self-medicating. Oh, 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 yeah. When I see a unicorn, I just mean somebody really walked in with all that information oh, with, all with, yeah. a, with a pretty bow on top. Yeah, that's <laughs> like, no, I believe that patient exists. Right. You just can't find them under all the chaos. It's like that's the, that's the hard part. But then all that being said, and, and this is another one where I, I really want your opinion, Dr. Cutler, because this is, I think, a little more your wheelhouse than mine. If someone's brain has been made dependent upon as we've agreed, extremely powerful, potent methamphetamine. Yeah. What's methylphenidate going to do for that yeah. brain? Well, methylphenidate is different from amphetamine in that it's merely blocking reuptake. And as you said, amphetamines also flip the transporter around and do some other things that pump out dopamine. So you're absolutely right. Amphetamines are more dopaminergic than methylphenidates and probably have a higher likelihood for abuse. So I guess it's reasonable to try it, but because it's probably less likely to make them uh, abuse it or crave it. Although I think, and I think to some degree, it depends on the patient's motivation. If they're highly motivated and seem to really want to stop, or if they've demonstrated sobriety, as you've said, through other treatment means, then it might be reasonable. Certainly non-stimulants would be ideal, although we don't have a whole lot of non-stimulants, especially approved for adults. Right, right. Another option would be to consider Listex amphetamine, which theoretically has a little less uh, likelihood for abuse. Yeah, theoretically. Well, and humans are so clever. <laughs> it's yes. like we can probably find a way to abuse anything. So I appreciate the, yeah, it's better to say harder to abuse than non abusable. Yeah. Another question about ADHD, you know, given the fact that there is a high comorbidity of substance use disorders with ADHD, as we know, it's clearly higher than the general population, and that's because of the dopamine dysregulation. Would you recommend checking drug screens, and what's your threshold for stopping a stimulant if you see it come back positive for methamphetamine? So I would absolutely positively recommend drug screens, and actually, I think the DEA supports me in that. Much like if one is going to be prescribing buprenorphine, you're dealing with a population that you know is high risk and you're dealing with controlled substances. And at the end of the day, I think just to be a little bit cynical, having those drug screens on file is what's going to protect you when inevitably someone from the government yeah. is knocking on your door Mostly. asking you how you're maintaining accountability. So absolutely, yes. Yeah. Uh, like now, when it comes to threshold for discontinuing the stimulants, this is another one that I'm interested. I'll tell you what I'm thinking, and then I'm interested in what you would think. Personally, I would have a very low threshold. If someone comes back positive, I think that I would tend to discontinue the stimulants immediately and then go from there with the patient. Maybe there might be some possibility that I could resume the stimulants. The reason that I say that is that I think the boundaries being extremely tight is the most therapeutic way to approach patients. Being a little bit vague and being loosey-goosey, to use a technical term, when it comes to those boundaries is very counter-therapeutic. And going back to reinforcement, nothing gets a human in a rut like kind of an intermittent, unpredictable reinforcement pattern, correct? Absolutely. So that it's like, well, if I pass or fail my drug screen, I may or may not get the stimulants is probably the opposite of the right way to approach any mammal, but especially the one that has a history of substance use disorder trying to get better. Yeah, I would agree with exactly what you said. And I think the other thing is to set the stage properly. And one of the things I do is I make sure to be very clear before I prescribe a stimulant that you should not use anything else that's a stimulant on top of this. And that includes a lot of street drugs like cocaine and things like that. So if a drug test comes back positive for cocaine or methamphetamine, 
they've violated what we talked about and I'm going to stop. And then I don't necessarily have a hard and fast never again rule like you were saying. I mean, if I can have a discussion with the patient and they seem reasonable and they seem contrite, you know, it's possible I'll give them a second chance. In other words, there's a path back. There's a path. So you're saying there's a chance. (laughs) All right, let's shift gears. We know we talked about some of the neurotoxicity and and kind of the long-term risk for abuse of methamphetamine. And we even talked about Parkinson's disease. What about methamphetamine abuse and movement disorders such as tardive dyskinesia, which is another dopamine dysregulation state? That's one that I'm not sure that there's really much data for that. I would say absolutely possible because once again, you know, dopamine, dopaminergic neurons and neurotoxicity is involved. So all those things are possible under the sun and worth thinking about. Yeah. I think it's very likely. One of the things that's well known is stimulants worsen tardive dyskinesia if it's there and can cause movement disorders such as tics, but also tardive dyskinesia. If you think about what you're doing and you're decreasing the amount of dopamine by killing dopamine neurons, the postsynaptic neuron is going to become super sensitive and upregulated. It's going to try to get whatever dopamine it can. And right. we think that's some of the underlying pathology of TD. It makes perfect sense. Speaking of that, let's talk about another possible consequence. What about the fact that we know that stimulant use and abuse can cause emotional dysregulation? Could that be a variant of pseudobulbar affect? And the next question is, could they respond to dextromethorphan or the combination of quinidine and dextromethorphan as treatment? Well, maybe. And going back down the neurotoxicity road, right, and with pseudobulbar affect being one of my favorite things to talk about over the years, yes, it's, I mean, pseudobulbar affect is associated with Parkinson's disease. If I wanted to make at least three poorly supported logical leaps, we could say that. <laughs> that it's, you know, it's associated with that and it goes together. That's reasonable, actually. If I had to take every condition that is typically associated with pseudobulbar affect, is it fair to say that it's diffuse injury and damage from back to front that can really lead to this syndrome? And and with that being said, a long-term use of a known neurotoxic substance would be a pretty reasonable culprit. Sure, I would absolutely agree. Pseudobulbar affect can come about, as you well know and lecture on, from any kind of neurologic insult or neurologic condition. So it makes sense. Exactly. And then I guess the question about treatment, it would be reasonable then to consider if you have somebody that looks like they have the clinical syndrome of pseudobulbar affect, to consider the dextromethorphan quinidine combination as a treatment. Well, extremely reasonable. And in contrast to what we've been talking about up until now, it might be an opportunity to get your patient some relief without necessarily going to a highly, highly controlled substance that requires a massive treatment contract and regular testing. If you could get relief, that would be a very elegant solution. Good. Well said. You know, another consequence that we touched on briefly earlier, but I want to come back to is the problem with psychotic symptoms, particularly auditory hallucinations and, and paranoid delusions and things. What can you tell us about the rate of drug-induced psychotic episodes for stimulants, especially methamphetamine? Well, it's about 13% for recreational users and as high as 27% for dependent users. So very, very, very high. So it's twice as high in those who are dependent, if you will, using regularly. Exactly. Speaking of that, so I would assume then that some treatments for this might involve dopamine blocking agents or antipsychotics. Does that sound reasonable to you? Very reasonable. Now, I do think it depends on whether or not you're in the acute phase versus a persistent psychosis. So again, drawing that distinction, the amphetamines and methamphetamines in the entire class are water soluble. It is possible that somebody can come in to an emergency room, all full of methamphetamines, very psychotic, and by the next day could potentially resolve. So in that particular instance, I don't know that I would be particularly excited about going right down the antipsychotic road. And also, I mean, a little bit worried about hyperthermia Mm -hmm. in this uh, group of patients. In the ER, in the acute setting, anything simple that I could use to help that patient go to bed and wake up in the morning and maybe be better, that would be my preferred route. But in persistent psychosis which is really what we're talking about here, then yes, all the traditional drugs from the antipsychotic class have potential there. 
I guess also if somebody's really chronically using and doing damage to their dopamine system, we should probably be careful with dopamine blockers and maybe use some lower potency ones. Yeah, I would agree with that. Not a bad idea. Speaking of various types of antipsychotics, you know, some of our patients we manage on LAIs, long-acting injectable antipsychotics. What are your thoughts about somebody who's episodically using methamphetamine while they're on an LAI? Is there any risk there? I really, really wish they wouldn't do that. That's what my thoughts are about that. <laughs> like, like, come on, man. <laughs> you're, you're killing me, Smalls. That's, uh, again, with the adverse effects, I don't know that there's going to be a direct one-to-one, like something that you would truly say was a medication interaction. But if you have someone on an LAI, obviously one would hope that's for a reason. And one of your number one goals is going to be D2 blockade And then methamphetamine is literally the opposite of that. I think that probably the biggest risk that occurred to me about this question is that someone on an LAI who seemed like they were doing fairly well may then appear to acutely decompensate and be at risk for someone changing their LAI. You know, like the LAI was working. It's like, oh my God, he's psychotic. He's relapsing. And we move to a different treatment when in fact it may have been an acute psychosis brought on by methamphetamine that could have resolved in a fairly short period with a little bit of patience. Or somebody could raise the dose of the LAI and cause toxicity that way. Yeah, also concerning. We've talked a little bit about the pros and cons of considering using psychostimulants to treat methamphetamine abuse. Are there other medications that maybe make sense or could help here? Well, there might be a little something to using an NDRI. Mm -hmm. of which there's only one, so bupropion. So there might be something there that could be helpful and going after that dopaminergic and noradrenergic mechanism. I've read a little bit, no personal experience on my part, but I've read a little bit about using monoamine oxidase inhibitors in this population. You might see some benefit there. Now, again, full caveat about a reliable patient that follows instructions if you're going to be using MAOIs. But going after, again, that dopamine reuptake, noradrenergic reuptake, and serotonergic reuptake is is probably the best bet. Yeah, it makes sense. Got a couple questions about comorbidities. What do you think about psychostimulant use in patients with bipolar disorder, especially maybe with a history of methamphetamine use? It's as if the questions are meant to escalate my anxiety with (laughs) with each new question. I can tell somebody dared you to try to get me on this one. <laughs> but, the, but the non-anxious answer as I continue to control myself is that you know, bipolar disorder and ADHD are traditionally kind of commonly reoccurring. About 30% of the time. So to that end, I think it could be argued that the appropriate treatment of ADHD with stimulants could result in improved impulse control and executive function reducing risk of relapse in such a patient. So in a perfect universe, when I'm confident in the diagnosis, then yes, appropriately treat the ADHD. And then maybe you have somebody who takes their medications and follows up appropriately and is less likely to relapse. Yeah, especially as long as you've got a mood stabilizer or an atypical antipsychotic on board, that makes sense. Exactly. There, there actually is data that motivated people, people who are motivated with a history of stimulant abuse actually their risk of relapse decreases if you prescribe a long-acting stimulant. So again, the key is motivated in someone who's demonstrated sobriety. That intuitively makes sense to me. Another comorbidity question is, what are your thoughts about the connection between binge eating disorder and substance use? I mean, binge eating disorder pretty clearly is a dopamine dysregulation phenomenon as well. And do you have any concern about treating binge eating disorder with the only approved drug to treat it, which is Listex amphetamine? Um, I don't know that concern is ever absent, right? That's why we get the big license (laughs) to work in an area where, yes, there's a certain element of risk. But I think it speaks to the same answer as bipolar disorder and ADHD. I agree with you completely that there's likely dopaminergic dysregulation, problems with impulse control, right? That, you know, binge eating disorder may well be a manifestation of an attempt to get these big dopamine responses and that is reinforcing over and over again. And if that patient also has substance use disorder, I think a case could be made that that they're different sides of the same coin. And if you can address that 
with a treatment like list X amphetamine, then you might see improvement across the board. And then speaking to your earlier point, list X amphetamine is at least probably the most difficult to abuse. Is that fair to say? Out of the entire class of stimulants? That is true. It's a pro-drug. And so taking a huge hit of it doesn't go directly to your brain. It has to circulate through the bloodstream when enzymes have to slowly cleave it. So, Exactly. It's rate limited, right? Music to our ears. (laughs) Music to our ears. Well, we've been talking about abuse of methamphetamine as if it's a pure kind of isolated case. But the fact is that people often use more than one drug and... So how would you address that clinically, the fact that people may not just be using meth, but there may be other things involved as well? Well, and clinically, that's the key word that you so astutely said, that there's no amount of urine tox screen, there's no amount of blood test that will make up for a proper clinical assessment. I'll make it even more confusing. Not only is it fairly common for people to be using slash abusing multiple drugs at once, but then the patient in front of you may not know what they're using. And going back to, you know, some sometimes methamphetamine is not made by the most studious chemists in the world. And and this may shock you, but the person who sold the methamphetamine to the person you're dealing with may not have been a paragon of integrity. Mm. So it's possible that they may have gotten something completely different. They may have found themselves using what's commonly known as bath salts different chemical, but it would provide enough of a stimulative effect to maybe fool somebody into thinking they got what they were expecting. Or it may have been adulterated with other substances. Mm -hmm. And some of those substances aren't even going to come up on a tox screen. Mm -hmm. So you may get a positive for methamphetamine and still not know that there were a couple other things mixed in. So it goes back to the best history you can possibly get looking at clinical signs and symptoms of acute intoxication or perhaps chronic use from a multitude. And then the things that we all learned in residency to get information from collaborative sources Mm -hmm. as much as humanly possible. Did you see what he used or does anybody have the baggie? You know, is there a way to find out exactly what somebody took? Well, I think that's very wise. And again, it all comes back to doing a careful clinical assessment and not just shutting your brain off or not just assuming whatever the patient tells you is what's going on. So we've had quite a wide ranging discussion here about methamphetamine. And Will, I want to thank you very much for sharing your expertise. It was really stimulating, uh, pun intended. (laughs) So to speak, yes. (laughs) So I want to thank you. And I want to thank you, the audience, for listening today. We hope this has been helpful, and especially in the clinical care of your patients. Thanks so much, Will. Thank you. Thank you for your participation in this NEI CME podcast episode. To receive your certificate of CME credit, please refer to this podcast's description page for a link to go online and print your certificate. This concludes the CME podcast presentation.